a commercial molten salt reactor fully operational on North American soil before 2030. Believe it or not, one company is claiming to do just that, but can they actually follow through? That's right, at long last, we're finally talking about terrestrial energy. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hello and welcome to Rock Logic. I'm your host, Sean Kenny. Before we get started, I want to ask you to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. If you like today's episode or want to ask me something, please leave your comments below. Your feedback helps us out a great deal. Also, I'd like to announce that we officially have merch for sale promoting thorium, molten salt reactors, and of course, the Rock Logic channel. You can find it at rocklogic.com shop. Today, I'm modeling the lovely thorium rock shirt, which believe it or not, actually glows in the dark. We talk a lot about molten salt reactors on this channel. While it's fun to discuss different designs, concepts, and approaches, it can get very frustrating. It's 2022, and aside from small scale prototypes being built in China, there isn't much happening with this technology in the West. There's a great deal of skepticism as to whether we will see one being built on this continent near term. That is, of course, if one were to completely discount terrestrial energy. Terrestrial Energy is a Canadian nuclear startup founded in 2013 with a goal to build commercial IMSR or integral molten salt reactors. In recent years, there have been some bold claims saying that they would hit the market by 2028. From where I stand, that sounds a bit nuts, but they may have the chops to back it up. Based on the denatured MSR design from the Oak Ridge days, this would be a single fluid burner. The term integral molten salt reactor comes from the fact that the reactor and major components are housed in a single integrated core. Everything from the moderator, the pumps, and the primary heat exchangers are contained in this single module. It's designed to be able to run for seven years. After that, the core is replaced and a new molten salt reactor is dropped in to continue operation. Unlike previous reactors we've gone over, this design uses low enriched uranium fuel with less than 5% uranium-235. This is a big deal because by using standard enrichment, you avoid the cost and time issues of relicensing uranium enrichment plants. This drastically removes hurdles associated with the deployment and commercialization of the reactor. The fuel itself is in the form of uranium tetrafluoride blended with other carrier salts such as lithium fluoride, sodium fluoride, and beryllium fluoride. These carrier salts increase the heat capacity of the fuel and lower the fuel's melting point, while also acting as the primary coolant for the reactor. The supply chain needed to operate this design is very well understood. For power conversion, they plan on using a conventional steam turbine system. No new technology is required. While it would be cool to see these things drive Brayton cycle gas turbines using supercritical CO2, it's not entirely necessary. Being based in Canada has some advantages. The regulators may not necessarily be faster or more efficient than the ones here in the United States, but the government isn't opposed to looking at new technologies, assuming you can prove that it's safe. This makes it easier to fund because you have a clear path to commercialization. Between 2013 and late 2016, they received $22.5 million in private investments and a $5.7 million grant from the Canadian government. This occurred around the same time they started engaging in pre-licensing of their design with the CNSC, Canada's nuclear safety regulator. In 2017, they completed the first phase and entered into a second phase of design review in October of 2018, shortly after receiving a $3 million grant from the U.S. Department of Energy's ARPA-E. In 2020, they received another $15 million from the Canadian government to develop IMSR technology. And in 2021, they received another grant from the U.S. Department of Energy to aid in development and licensing costs. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why the U.S. Department of Energy is helping a Canadian company with funding and development. Well, because it's not a one-sided deal. Earlier this month, Ontario Power Generation selected US-based GE Itachi's BWRX300 SMR design. This will be Canada's first commercial grid-scale small modular reactor design for the Darlington nuclear site outside Toronto. This is a 300 megawatt boiling reactor that will demonstrate its capabilities in the province. In addition to Canada, GE Itachi has agreements in place with utilities and companies in the US, Poland, Estonia, and the Czech Republic to explore the possibility of deployment of the technology in these countries. Unfortunately, this was a bit of a blow for Terrestrial because they were on the short list of being considered for the Darlington site along with GE and X Energy. They even modified the design to meet utility requirements and boost its cost competitiveness as part of an effort to ramp up its candidacy. However, this wasn't the only project they were looking to get involved in. 
In September of 2021, a Memorandum of Understanding was signed between Terrestrial and the First Nations Power Authority to explore the development of SMR technologies to benefit Indigenous communities in Canada. In April, four Canadian provinces signed a Memorandum of Understanding to affirm their commitment to small modular reactor development and commercial deployment. On top of that, Terrestrial has been in licensing engagements with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission since 2019. If Canada is willing to accept a U.S. small modular reactor design for commercial deployment, it's not too crazy to think that we would accept a Canadian design in the United States. After all, the company already has support from Oak Ridge National Labs. This is a well-funded company with support from the U.S. and Canadian governments. They are very far along the licensing process. Once approved and assuming they get one of these provincial utility providers to pay for one, it wouldn't take much longer for the NRC to catch up in approving a license for the U.S. market. They only need to prove safety and operational capabilities, which is why the Department of Energy is helping out with licensing costs. Hopefully this works out. The sooner we start seeing molten salt reactors in commercial operation, the better. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic.